I have uh, very much pleasure in declaring the XPT train the winning entry for the 1981 Australian Transport Industry Award. Right, Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Behind this event lies some two years of the most intensive rail vehicle design, development and construction ever undertaken in this country. It marks the beginning of a new era, not only in railways, but engineering technology in connection with railways in this country. I want to congratulate Tom Eng on a fine job. I want to congratulate the men and women who built and outfitted the train. And I'll tell you boys, there's plenty more where this came from. The first XPT entered commercial service in New South Wales on the 8th of April 1982, just two and a half years after Commonwealth Engineering were asked to develop their proposal for an alternative to 11 different design types required by the State Rail Authority. The XPT is accepted as being the most significant development in Australian intercity passenger train design in the past 30 years providing a standard equal to the very best of overseas rail systems. The stainless steel passenger cars are fully air-conditioned with wide panoramic windows of specially treated glass that reject 75% of the sun's heat. Numerous options are available through the use of a modular design throughout the train. In New South Wales, a buffet car provides meals at a servery counter for the passengers to carry back to their seats. But the wide automatic doors, interconnecting vestibules and roomy corridors allow the option of airline type trolleys so stewards could serve meals at the passenger seats. The deeply upholstered reclining seats are ideally suited to long journeys while the airbag suspension means there's little vibration transferred from the track. The XPT was designed to suit existing track conditions in Australia. In New South Wales, the mountains and numerous curves made design of a high-performance train particularly difficult. Here, there are some of the longest and steepest mainline grades in the world. A very high power-to-weight ratio was required for fast acceleration through the hills. But this meant that rapid, efficient and reliable braking was of equal importance. Much of Australia's track, particularly in New South Wales, dates back to the early days. So design of the suspension system and bogies provided other unique problems. Considerable movement, both vertically and laterally, had to be built into the suspension, much greater than for any overseas train, so that the passengers would not be aware of the lumps and bumps in the track. has been said about the XPT being a copy of the British HST. But while the general design concept is based on the HST under a Comenge license agreement with British Rail, there's a great deal of difference between the two trains. The British mainline track is carpet smooth in comparison with gentle curves and lower gradients. Thus, the British HST can maintain top speeds on their mainline system of 125 miles an hour or 200 kilometers without any damage to the track or discomfort for the passengers. But the HST, if transported complete to Sydney, would never get over the first gradient, let alone stay on our meandering track. Well, it's a great concept, Sid. But we've got a lot of work to do before we can get to work in Australia. Yes, there's certainly a lot of redesign work to do to begin with. We've got to rework the suspension units. We've got to re-gear it to handle your gradients. We've got the engine to derate. And we've got a very much larger cooler group to fit in. And of course, your whole structure is larger anyway. Basically, it's a complete redesign around that original concept. Oh, very much so. The decision to use the HST concept was made in 1979. 
then, in close association with British Rail through their subsidiary Transmark, a complete redesign began at Commonwealth Engineering's Granville headquarters. The latest computer technology available at Comeng meant that they were able to reduce the design time to months rather than years. But in train design, there's much that only the human touch can achieve, and many hundreds of man hours were used in producing sketches, layouts, and models. In some cases, these were taken to full-size mock-up stage, so that the designers and engineers were able to check the practical applications before proceeding further. And this is the centre panel, which remembering that this is all black, and uh, with white lettering on each of the gauges and dials, so that the pressure gauges are the lower meter. Particular emphasis was placed on the cabin and on the design of the bogies. Both were to set entirely new standards in Australia, so engineers and unions had to be satisfied. Two prototype bogies were designed and tested exhaustively on New South Wales tracks. These were the result of prolonged computer analysis of existing track conditions. Dummy passenger loads were carried over the bogies at speeds up to 140 kilometres an hour. The ride in the locomotive and in the standard instrument car provided a sharp contrast to the smoothness of the passenger car under test. The ride index figures were comparable to an average European train on their very best track. Even the techniques used in the construction of the power car broke new ground in Australia. For instance, the underframe consists of a series of individual segments, each of which is fully welded, x-rayed and machined prior to being assembled in the main construction jig. This method minimizes weld distortions in the completed structure and overall critical dimensions are maintained within close tolerances. It also allowed great weight saving, a critical factor in the design of a high performance train. The side frames were also prefabricated in jigs, again resulting in weight reduction and close tolerances. These completed frames were simply stood up on the underframe, interconnected and welded into position. Comenge had originally intended the power car to be in stainless steel, but the customer decided upon the heavier carbon steel. Even so, a special welding technique still resulted in a perfectly smooth surface. 